Good morning. Welcome to First Light. We're in Genesis 32, and today I want to talk about facing fear, because fear is one of the main topics of Genesis 32. It, it pervades the entire chapter. Look with me at chapter 32, for example, verse 6. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he's coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. In Genesis 31, verse 13, God told Jacob to go home, to go back to his prom the promised land, to the, his native country where he was born. And Jacob has been gone now for 20 years. And while that's a long time, remember how he left 20 years ago. His own brother had stated out loud that he planned to murder Jacob. And while 20 years is a long time, there is no way that Esau has forgotten what Jacob did to him. How Jacob lied and deceived his own father and tricked him into giving him the blessing of the firstborn, giving it to Jacob when it should have gone to Esau. So friends, let's be honest. This At this point in the story, this is a life-threatening situation. Jacob is returning to face the man who said that he would kill him. And the natural response is to be afraid, to be fearful. And that's exactly what Jacob is feeling. Now, I know that this is a pretty extreme situation, one that most of us would never face. But it's not rare for you and I to face fearful situations. That is not rare, friends. I'm, I'm not talking about fearing something unknown and worrying about something that's probably never going to happen. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fear when we feel that we're feeling, when we know something difficult has got to be faced or is about to happen. For example, here's a couple of examples I thought of. In your job, something has gone wrong. And maybe even you made a mistake, and now you face a disciplinary meeting. Well, that's a potentially fearful situation. Or that all-too-common situation where you have a mass in your body, and all indications are that it's cancer. Or you have a drug-addicted grandson who's been living in your cottage on your property. You've been trying to help out for years. You've struggled with this. You've tried to help him, but nothing has worked. He rejects God and all attempts to help. And now you need to evict him. And you're just dreading the situation. Or you're being sued. And there's a significant possibility that you may lose your home or your spouse is in ICU and needs a very serious surgery. Friends, the, the possibilities are endless, but the situation that I'm painting for you is when you're feeling fearful in the face of something that really is fearful, not imaginary. It, I mean, it really is. We're not talking about worrying over something that may never happen, uh, something that we can all wrestle with. I'm talking about a real and very fearful thing in your life that you absolutely must face or should face, whether you like it or not. This is where Jacob is. This was there, there was no question about three things. First of all, there's no question. God told him to go home. Secondly, the last thing Jacob knew, his brother wanted to kill him. I mean, I mean, there's no question about that. And Jacob remembers that. And then thirdly, Jacob knows that if he's going to go home, he's got to face the brother who wants to kill him. So when you've been in situations where fear is high over something that's before you, how, how do you feel 
I, I mean, obviously, aside from afraid, obviously that, but you can also feel helpless and you can feel often alone. Anger is not rare, nor are tears. How, how do you respond to this moment and this event, friends? Now, I know the situations are endless, and no one answer fits every situation. I know that, but, but let's talk about this as best we can, even if it's in some somewhat generalities, using the life of Jacob. When these moments come into our lives, it's, it's kind of like a fork in the road, conceptually speaking. There are two main responses when you are facing fear. The first, you can either run or you can face the situation. Now, running can happen in several ways. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who do run in the face of fear. You can physically run. I mean, physically run. You can, you can leave the situation completely. You could move to a different neighborhood, move to a different city. You can emotionally run. You can emotionally withdraw. When a decision needs to be made, you choose not to make it. That's running from the situation. Running in the face of fear is a common instinctive response. You're not weird if you feel like doing it, but it's rarely the best response. The other primary option is to face the fear, to face the situation. It's actually the courageous thing to do. And one of the important truths of life that any of us could learn is the, is the true definition of courage or bravery. Courage and bravery are not about what a person feels. Courage does not mean that the person does not fear, at least not for most people. Courage is really more of an action, not a feeling. Courage is doing the right thing in spite of being afraid. Courage is, is not having no fear. Instead, courage is when you face your fear head on. Now, friends, when we're facing a fearful situation, whatever it is, one of the greatest things that we can do is, is simply facing the fear that's at hand. I mean, that's the first step is to face it because one of the natural effects of fear is paralysis. I cannot emphasize enough Facing the moment instead of running away physically or emotionally is the first and very important step. After all, Jacob could have emotionally bailed out. I, I mean, he could, have, he could have changed direction. He could have gone to live somewhere else, but he didn't. He's going to meet his brother Esau. He's facing this fear. He's not turning around. He's not changing course. He's going to face this fear. And so that's the first thing that we see here. Secondly, Jacob takes some practical physical steps. And we're going to talk more about the spiritual in a moment. But first, let's notice how he takes some practical steps. In this situation, Jacob did a couple of things. First of all, in verse 7, Jacob divided everyone into two groups just as we read a, a moment ago. Now, Jacob, in verse 7, Jacob is planning for the possibility that Esau uh, might attack his family. Jacob might die, and, and his family may be attacked. So he's thinking that if one group is captured or killed, at least the other group might escape. So another practical step that is taken in verse 13 and following is he sends gifts to Esau. Large groups of animals, 220 goats, 220 sheep, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 30 donkeys. He broke them into groups and sent one group after another with a servant, and each one of the servants was instructed to say the same thing. It's in verse 17. He instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, where do you belong to? Who do you belong to? And where are you going? And who owns all these animals in front of you? Then you are to say they belong to your servant Jacob. 
They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second and the third and all the others who followed the herds. You are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say, be sure to say, your servant, Jacob, is coming behind us. For he thought, I'll, I'll pacify Esau with these gifts that I'm sending ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. Now, friends, there are different ways that these verses can be taken interpretively. For example, it could be viewed as a lack of faith. It could be viewed as fleshly, human striving instead of trusting God. It could even be seen as being manipulative. And, and it could be. I, I'm not going to deny that. But I personally don't think so. The, the dividing of his family could look like he doesn't trust God. But friends, there's a place for making wise decisions while still trusting God in a fearful situation. If I'm in a dangerous situation in a supermarket or, a, or walking down the street... I'm trusting God, but I'm also going to put my wife behind me. The, the two are not mutually exclusive. So I think that he could be viewed as making some wise decisions while still trusting God. Let, let me give you a, another very simple and, in this case, emotionally charged example. Someone is fearfully facing a major surgery, a critical major surgery. Someone could argue, and many do, that you should think only positively and you should pray and claim God's healing and then you need to act on that belief. And, and that's good. But I have a simple, very practical question for you. Have you updated your will? Do you even have a will? You're, you're facing the surgery. Have you prepared and done something wise to provide for the people after you? Now, I know that how many Christians would think about what I just suggested. They would say that updating your will is a, is a negative confession, that you are already headed to the grave because you're planning on dying. But friends, you ought to update your will. In fact, you should have probably done it before now. That's why it needs updating, because you're already behind in doing it. That doesn't mean that you're not trusting God. It means that you're taking positive steps and making wise decisions. Jacob is trusting God, and as we'll see in a moment, he's asking God to preserve his life in this situation, this very dangerous situation. But this simple action is a wise one, in my opinion. Others may disagree. I, I understand that. And what about the gifts? I, I know they, they could look like they're sort of like bribes. I mean, I mean it could look that way. W w it could look very fleshly. We would, we would say, in sort of negative terms, he's trying to butter up, trying to butter Esau up. A and maybe that's what's happening. But friends, remember who this man, Jacob, is. He's a swindler. He was a liar. The family curse was a part of his life before. He has done great harm to his brother Esau over the years. He took advantage of his brother's foolishness by getting Esau to sell his birthright to him. And then he flat out stole he lied and stole the prophetic blessing from the father. He has done great harm to Esau. And these gifts could be viewed as a tangible way of at least trying to smooth things over since the harm that Jacob caused was financial. I mean, it was, it was 
birthright. It was the blessing of the Father for prosperity. He has done great harm to Esau. So whether this is truly fleshly or not, to me, it also seems like a wise thing to do when you were the one who was wrong and caused all this in the first place. Jacob has been the bad guy in this relationship until now. So when you're facing something fearful in front of you, you face it. And then secondly, you could ask, are, are there any practical tangible things which you could or which need to be done in order to be wise and in order to be prudent. And then, most importantly, thirdly, you need to go to God. That's most importantly. The others don't matter if you're not willing to do that. Look at verse 9, because I think this is a powerful prayer by Jacob. And I'm telling you, this prayer is very telling. Verse 9, and then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and I will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted." Now, friends, Jacob has prayed before. We, we have a record of a prayer that he made back in chapter 28, verse 13 through 15. But that prayer is a very different prayer from this prayer. Notice in this, that prayer, remember, was the one where God promised he'd watch over him. And Jacob's answer is, well, uh, if, you promise to, if you will watch over me, then I will give you a, a tithe, the tenth of all that I have when God already said he was going to watch over him. He doesn't trust God. But look at this one. Look at this prayer. Jacob is talking to God as if he knows God. Because remember, 20 years ago, when he talked to his daddy in that tent, the Lord, your God, gave me success in hunting this animal when he was lying. He did not know God back then. Now he does. And also notice there's no bargaining like there was before. God, you do this and then I'll do that. There is one huge word that is missing from this prayer. It is the word, if. There's no if in this prayer. Notice also his humility. Verse 10, I, Lord, I am unworthy of all the kindness and the faithfulness that you have shown me. The lying, arrogant man has truly had a changed heart, friends. And in verse 11, he makes a simple request of God. God, save me. Save me from the hand of the brother who wants to kill me. Save me, Lord, preserve my life. And then verse 12 is an expression of faith. He's trusting God. He's remembering the promises that God made to him, and he's counting on those promises. Now, I, I could be wrong, but I think that Jacob is less worried about his own life as much as he is about his wives and his children. These children are the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Jacob about making a lot of descendants and becoming a great nation. So Jacob does not know how this will turn out. But friends, it's clear. His trust is in God. And an extra way that I know his trust is in God, is because in the following verses, it says that he chose to be alone. He did not face Esau. 400 men plus Esau with a bunch of his own men, all armed to the teeth. No, no. 
You could say he's being fleshly. He's 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 acting wily. He's I think he's making wise decisions and he is going alone and trusting God in this situation. I, I'm not saying that you should be alone. Sometimes having somebody with you is the wise thing to do for moral support and have somebody to share with you. But because he is the one who has wronged Esau, any group of men that he brings with him in this situation looks like he's ready for a fight, ready to defend himself. You can't say that about one guy who's all by himself. His faith is in God. He doesn't know how it's going to turn out but he's trusting God. He's taken some wise and practical steps, but his ultimate trust is in God. He is facing the fear that he's dreading. But with God's help, he chooses to face it and move through it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, most of us have never and will never have our lives threatened. But Lord, almost every single person listening to me has had to face extremely fearful moments in their lives. We all do. And, and so Lord, I pray that you would teach us to face those, to be courageous, to deal with the feelings we've got swirling inside of us, to face our fears and to put our trust in you. And Lord, we don't know how they'll turn out, but we're going to trust you no matter what just like Job did, just like Daniel did, just like so many people. We're going to trust you no matter what because you're our God and you're our king. And this fearful moment is not the end of the story. For we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Have a good day in Jesus. This is First Light.